Ça veut dire. Okay, there we go. There's a bit of technical troubleshooting on the uh, side of the uh, So, for all of you that described, this is the uh, future of our data uh, session uh, by Frank Kalinic. Kalinic, yes. Um, and so, Frank probably does not need much of an introduction with his involvement in the open source community for many years, but just to briefly share that he's uh, presented at many different conferences. He's been a member of the whole of the KE community. And so now focusing on really the CEO of Nextcloud, um, based on Germany. And um, Frank will really talk about the kind of data, data sharing, uh, documents on the internet that are controlled by vendors. So Frank, over to you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I said it um, before the last few days, one of my favorite conferences. I really like the, like the energy here and uh, the interest in so many young people who like to learn about free software and open source um, and how to get involved. Uh, really, it's one of my favorite places here. So really good to be here. So um, as I said, um, or I was, to, as was introduced, the topic is the future is our data. A um, little bit about me, um, I was already introduced. Um, Frank Karliczek, I'm from Germany, as you can hear. <laughs> it's my strong accent. Um, I'm involved in free software for a long time, and KDE and other projects. Um, and and I'm, as mentioned before, I'm probably in, invited here as the yeah. founder of OwnCloud and the successor of NextCloud. So um, one thing I noticed here at a conference, and this is not a surprise, this is for a lot of conferences, that um, one of the big topics is, of course, the cloud. Um, so the cloud um, can mean different things, different ways to see it, in, and also like cloud can be like cloud infrastructure or um, I don't know, Docker is sometimes, this means the cloud and different ways to see the cloud. When I talk about the cloud, I mean more from the user perspective, that we have like, um, like services, um, software as a service, that are run or are used by many users, like Gmail or Facebook or Dropbox and many others. And they are running their computer systems, obviously, their software, their data, their infrastructure, running somewhere else and use them as a user. So that's what I mean with with cloud here. Um, and this becomes more and more popular, of course, as we all know. Um, but um, there are also people who are a little bit more skeptical, uh, who think this is maybe not a 100% not a, not a great trend. Um, and if you ask them why is that, one of the main things they bring up is always like security and privacy. So I collected a few um, studies. Um, over the last few months, who covered this? But here's an interesting study that the number one um, thing that holds holds people and companies and organizations, governments back of adopting the cloud is security. Um, here's another one. This is security and also vendor login. Vendor login, of course, as you as you know, is one of the big things. If you ever used um, like let's say Office 365, um, then it's really basically impossible to move out again and use something else. I mean, you can migrate your files maybe, but all the metadata and all the other people that you interacted with, it's basically impossible. And the same is for Google Suite and for, for all these other applications. So the vendor login is a really big problem. This is another graphic <laughs> that, is, that I found. Um, there is again, like here, security compliance is the number one concern. And then you have network latency. And then you have like migrate things around from the from in-house to um, to uh, also from on on-premise to off-premise. So lots of concerns again, all about the security of things. And then we have very interesting topics like like that one. This is this is interesting. We wrote a blog post here a few months ago um, because a lot of people think, especially in the in, in governments and in um, in companies. We think that, well, we use the cloud, but we use a local cloud. So we use something like um, something that's hosted like on, in our country or like close where we trust. OK, this is like an Amazon data center or it's a Google data center or it's a Salesforce data center. And this is running like locally in my country. And this means it's safe, right? So it's basically no one has access to it, only like the local government and, and we have access to it. Well, the thing is, there's actually a lot of discussion going on at the moment, especially in the US, if this is actually the case. 
and there is a Supreme Court case pending, which is like will be ruled the next few months, if this is really true or not. And it's actually likely that they decide that um, the US law enforcement <laughs> thinks they have access to everything worldwide, even if it's not running on their own, uh, in their own country, it's running somewhere else, if it's operated by a US um, company. So it's a, actually a, a service run by Amazon or by Google or by Dropbox or Microsoft or many others. But if it's basically run by a US company, then the US legislation think they have access to it, even if it's hosted like in Singapore or somewhere else. And that's of course a big, um, a big concern because then all this whole data protection laws, they are basically questionable if they're really still valid or not. Um, and now it becomes really interesting because this is all heating up. When I came here, just like a few, uh, two hours ago, I saw, um, saw some news. So actually, um, like two hours ago, um, Trump signed in a new law, which basically gave like exactly what I just said, gave like US um, legislation full access to all the cloud data hosted somewhere else. And I just created this slide like two minutes ago here before my talk, <laughs> because this is news from this morning. So this is really, um, we have to understand that everything we store in the cloud is basically something that can be seen and analyzed and used by, by other people. It's, we can't consider this to be private or secure or anything. And you also saw the Facebook scandal, of course, right, where you can see what can happen with the public, with the data you put there. So this is all becomes really interesting. On the other hand, of course, the cloud is very useful. We all like it. It's very convenient. You have your small, uh, cell phones and you, s you can share with others and you can synchronize data around. It's very, very handy. Um, so for me and the rest of the Nextcloud community, it was also always the question, can we combine somehow the benefit of this, of this um, of infrastructure that's running under our control and the cloud, the cloud features? And this is actually what we want to do with Nextcloud. So Nextcloud is something where a project where you want to provide the same features and same functionality that you know from Office 365 and Google Suite and, and Dropbox and all the other services, but you can actually run it on your own infrastructure. And with your own infrastructure, it doesn't have to be like a box at home. You can do this. It runs like a small Raspberry Pi if you want to, but you can also run it like in your company, uh, at your university, in your government. So really under control. Of course, you shouldn't then use something like Amazon or Google Cloud because then again, as I said before, someone else has access to it. But if you choose an infrastructure like a, a local service provider, for example, which is, by the way, also good for the local industry here, right? just go to a lo local service provider, put your, put your data there, maybe install Nextcloud and you have your own, own little private secure uh, cloud, which has all the features and is very secure. So this is what we try to build. Okay, so what exactly is that? So um, when I started with this whole idea eight years ago, there was no real name for it. At the time, I called it open source Dropbox, which of course is a terrible way of describing what I'm doing <laughs> if I compare myself to a competitor. But um, in the meantime, uh, Gartner came up with this term, enterprise file sync and share. And this is basically the name of what it is. The idea is that if you have your files in the middle, and you can access your files from iOS and Android and Mac, Windows, Linux, and the web interface and web stuff and so on. You can synchronize them online, offline. You can share them with others. You have a web interface versioning, encryption also, um, and so on. Basically, the functionality you know from Dropbox and OneDrive and iCloud and all the other services. So this is what we are doing. Um, this is the web interface, a bit hard to see. It's basically a file manager. It's not super exciting. You have your files in the middle. <coughs> you here you can filter, you can search, you have subdirectories, can drag and drop, and so on. Um, we have desktop and mobile clients. On the left, it's really hard to see. On the left, you see our iOS client. It basically can manage your files. The same is available for Android, of course. Looks exactly the same. On the right, you have the desktop syncing client. This is a settings dialog. You usually don't see this. It sits in your sys tray, minimized, and it synchronizes folders around. So you can say, hey, this folder here from my important work documents, I want to, be, uh, have, want to synchronize them to this, um, to this server I'm running at home. And this other folder I want to synchronize to my um, server that's run by my university, for example. So it's really flexible. It's more powerful than the other um, competitors' clients. 
Um, here you can see that we also have in the web interface have this sidebar here where you can, can also do comments and tagging and activities and versioning of files. So it's also a little bit more than just copying files around. You can really interact with other people who also have access to my, to my files because I shared them with them. Um, every picture we, uh, we synchronize, um, for example, if you do auto-upload from your mobile phone, every picture you take can be uploaded to, to your Nextcloud instance. It automatically generates these um, photo galleries here, where um, you can obviously see your photos. But interesting is here on the, on the top, you have the sharing dialog. You can say sharing, I want to share this photo gallery, and then you can select people. And you can select people from, the own, from your own server that you interacted with, or you can also search people, and you can also find people on other servers. So we have a very sophisticated technology where you can actually find people on other instances via federated sharing and you can share with them, which is quite nice. And if you also, if you find a person, there's also this small menu here where you can say, um, hey, I want to chat with this person, I want to email this person, I want to have a video call with this person, but a little bit more about this later. Another thing you can do is collaborative editing. This is very, very <laughs> popular. So if I synchronize a Word document or Excel or PowerPoint or OpenOffice or LibreOffice, then you can um, share this document with others. And if you both click on the file, then you get this nice editor here where you then can um, edit your document together. So very similar to Office 365 or Google Docs, but completely open source and completely running on your own server. And the same is possible for Excel files. Here's a complicated Excel file with some calculations and diagrams, and this is all working. It's very powerful, and the reason is that a full LibreOffice is running in the background. So we use a full LibreOffice on the server side to render this, and this is very important to render like complex Microsoft Office documents. And that's the reason it's fully compatible. We can do authentication, Active Directory, um, LDAP, um, SAML, um, um, OAuth, um, two-factor authentication with Google Authenticator or with SMS, so it's very secure. Um, we have this here, which we call an app store. It's not really a store because everything is open source and for free, but it's a place where the community can publish extensions. And we have over 100 of those extensions for all kinds of use cases. Here's like one where you can draw like diagrams in your next cloud, you can arrange the menu, and there's a markdown editor, and many, many more. So it's a very flexible plugin system for all kinds of extensions. So and now I want to talk a little bit more about some, some key features that are really interesting, because what I showed you so far is also something that other software can do. But what I have here is something that's very unique for next cloud. The first is a concept that we call a data access engine. So this means that if you have some storage somewhere else, if you have a, a Dropbox account, a Google account, an FTP server, SharePoint, a Samba share, something, you can all mount this into your next cloud if you want. Right, so it's very powerful in a, in a company or in a university or in a government where you might have a Windows file server or a Samba server or a SharePoint server or an FTP or whatever already and you can basically mount this all together and use Nextcloud to aggregate your data, to basically have one place where you have access to all your data. And this becomes really powerful um, because we also have a full text search. You can then use Nextcloud to search your files over all, um, over all data silos in the backend. Another thing uh, we can do, um, we have very advanced groupware integrated nowadays. So we have a full calendar and contacts and email integrated. So this is a screenshot of the, of the calendar. This is the web interface. But you can also access it from um, Android and iOS and Linux and Windows, of course. We have an Outlook connector and a Thunderbird um, connector. Um, so it's a really um, fully working group here. This is the screenshot of the web, inter of the web interface of the email client. Um, and these are our plugins. As I said, we are fully compatible with Outlook and Thunderbird and works natively on iOS and Android and Linux and so on. Another interesting thing is a second Outlook plugin we have for, um, for handling attachments. It's very um, popular in companies where you open your Outlook and you want to send a big attachment to someone, but you can't because the attachment is too big. Well, if you have our plugin installed, then you press send 
Then the first thing that happens is this attachment is uploaded to your Nextcloud account. A sharing link is generated, put into the mail, and then the, the mail is sent out. So this is really popular. Another feature we have is the federation concept, which means if you have different Nextcloud servers, let's say um, this is a Nextcloud server I'm running at home. This is another Nextcloud server, which is from a service provider here. This is a university. Another Nextcloud server is, some, is a company. Um, and there are different users connected to these different Nextcloud servers. We can still have shared folders between different servers. That's a very interesting concept. So I can have, a, can have shared folders with everyone that don't have to be on my own machine. So it's a it's federation which becomes this really, really interesting. Next concept I want to show you is global scale. So um, now I want to have to explain a little bit more what Nextcloud really is, because Nextcloud is two things. First of all, we are an open source community. We are really completely open, self-governed open source community with, um, <coughs> according to our statistics, over 500 people contributed to the last release. So it's a really active community. It's not really a theoretical community, but really have over 500 people who actively work on Nextcloud. But there's also a Nextcloud company um, where we offer like services for bigger organizations and, and companies and service providers and governments and universities who want to have support and branding and other things. And um, these companies, they come to us as a, as, a, as a company and say, hey, can you help us running this Nextcloud instance? <laughs> um, and Nextcloud runs, as I mentioned before, from very small. It really runs on Raspberry Pi for two, three users, not a problem. But there are also organizations coming to us and say, hey, I want to run Nextcloud for 20 million users. So in fact, the biggest installation we have at the moment is for 20 million users. So for 20 million users, you don't really want to have them in one database, and one storage. Even with a clustered application server setup, it's not really, it doesn't really scale that well. So we introduce this global scale architecture, which basically makes it possible that you can have a Nextcloud instance distributed over different hosting centers, over different continents. So that's a really, really powerful um, concept, especially because we can enforce data locality. You can say that the data of this user shouldn't leave this country. Or all documents that are tagged with this VIP tag or something should, only, should always be encrypted in this other data center. So it becomes really also powerful to enforce um, data protection laws. Next thing I want to mention is a feature that we launched earlier this year. This was the number one feature request since the very beginning of OwnCloud and Nextcloud. Can we please have client-side encryption or end-to-end -end encryption for sharing of files? And it actually took a, took a few years to come up with the right idea how to do the key management and everything the right way. But we finally, beginning of this year, launched full end-to-end -end encrypted um, um, file sync and share, also with sharing. So you can also share with other people and they're still end-to-end -end encrypted. Then another thing we launched earlier this year, um, very exciting in my opinion, is that um, file sync and share is nice. You can synchronize and share your files. But if I share my files with someone and I can edit it together, as I showed you earlier, we also want to communicate. <coughs> we also want to uh, have a video call and a, and a chat to discuss what we are doing with this document here together. And this is why we introduced um, a new product called Nextcloud Talk. And that's audio, video, calling, and chat, and screen sharing. And the interesting thing here, again, this is, again, 100% open source, and it's 100% self-hosted. So you can enable this small plugin for your Nextcloud server, and then it basically turns your Nextcloud server into a communication tool. So it becomes like a, your own phone system, in a way, because we also have a SIP gateway, where you can actually then call in, have a conference call, all running open source on your own server. And we have uh, mobile apps, I have it here, uh, mobile apps for iOS and for Android native, where you can also like see all your contacts, click on them, and then the phone of this other person rings. So a similar experience, you know, from FaceTime and Hangout and so on, but it never goes through a central server. It always communicates, always goes through your local server. So this is a in my opinion, the only solutions at the moment 
which is 100% open source and federated and self-hosted and gives you the same experience than what you get with all these other um, fancy um, video and chat applications you have on the mobile nowadays. And of course you also have a web interface where you can have video calls and audio calls with other people. Um, this is how the chat can be integrated into the actual web interface. So if you have a shared folder and you want to work together with people on documents in this folder, you can also have a chat channel here. And this is XMPP compatible. So you can also use your XMPP mobile chat to participate and chat with the people here. And we also have a group chat, which is very popular, like a Slack competitor. Again, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it's the main thing. <laughs> it's open source and self-hosted running on your own server. So that's, the, that's a full Slack competitor, but running under your control. With your user accounts and your passwords and, and your code that you can audit and, and so on. OK, so how can I run all of that? People come to our website and say, hey, where can I register? Where can I create an account? Well, you can't, because we don't run anything. Right? We only provide the software. We give you the software so that you can put the software somewhere and then have your own service. We don't run a service. We don't have any service. But how can I run it? Well, obviously it needs some kind of operating system. In the past, we tried to support Windows, Windows on the server side, which didn't work that well. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Windows servers. Um, so nowadays, we support Linuxes and, and BSDs. So everything that's Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu, Debian, or whatever, it's totally fine. Um, databases, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, Oracle. There's also SQLite for very small installations or for testing if you want to. But something like Postgres or MySQL, MariaDB is like recommended. Um, there are Docker containers done by us and by the community, which are totally um, pre-configured virtual machines for different operating systems. There's something in OpenShift, uh, Kubernetes. So it's uh, lots of different ways to deploy it however you want. It's really flexible. Um, from a storage side, we can use any kind of storage exist on your server, like an NFS-mounted storage, but also natively object stores like S3 and Swift. Um, again, 100% open source, which means that the server core is HTPL. Um, the clients are GPL, and um, this is also done by an active community, as I said, which is really important. I don't really like those open source projects that are open source, but you can't really participate. The only thing you can do is you get a new tar file, like once a year, and then, hey, here it is, this is open source. Well, sure, technically it is open source, but I really like the community and the collaboration aspect of open source. So this is also what we have here. If you want to run it in your company and your enterprise, then you can do this too. You don't need to talk to us. It's download it, install it, use it. And it has many advantages over other solutions. It has no vendor login. You can just take it and use it forever. You don't have to pay anything. Um, you have the right to change and distribute it. You have the security. You can audit it. Um, we, you can participate in the community if you want. And it has really clear licenses. So a lot of people say sometimes that, hey, this whole GPL thing, I, that is not really clear what it means to our company. Is it really secure? Um, I still hear this from time to time. I heard it like a year ago from a, from a big American bank who have a policy that I don't trust GPL somehow. I don't know. That's OK. Then use something else. Um, but uh, for the rest of the world, I think more and more people understand that GPL actually gives you nice security. Because if you don't use free software licenses like GPL and you use like, some license agreement from Oracle or SAP or something, well, this is really hard to understand what it actually means. And that change all the time. Right? So your lawyers have a lot of work to do, like reviewing all these terms of services and and contracts and understand what it really means if it affects your business or not. GPL is actually very well understood and proven, so this gives you a lot of security. So how to get involved? Because um, we are an open source community, so this is um, everybody can contribute. How to get involved? Everything we do is in the open on GitHub. So um, the source code is there, all the bugs, the feature requests, the pull requests, open development, the roadmap planning, everything is there. 
and we don't have the different processes of the things that like people who are paid to do Nextcloud, they're not special, we are all the same. So the process is always the same, you open a pull request and then um, everybody can do this by the way, you don't need to have any special permission or something, you open a pull request <coughs> with a change you propose and then two other core people have to approve that, they have to say yes, looks good and this can be someone like doing full-time or another student from somewhere, doesn't matter, but someone who is involved has to say, yeah, this looks good. And then all our automatic tests that we do, uh, we do a lot of automatic tests and unit testing and acceptance testing and so on. They all have to be green, they all have to be successful. And if this is all good, then it's merged. So everybody can do this. So it's really possible to really get involved really easily. And you don't have to be like a hardcore coder, you can also do translations or design fixes or other things. So we have a lot of, lot of opportunity to get involved. Um, and we do our conference once a year in Berlin. So if you want to come, if you want to, want, want to get involved, we also offer um, travel support. So um, uh, we can help you getting there. We do hackathon several times a year. And we do lots of meetup all over the place. I'm not sure if there's a meetup in Singapore yet. There are several meetups all over the place. If there's no meetup in Singapore yet, maybe yeah, we should do one. Um, so it is a good opportunity to get in contact with other people here. Okay, so another summary from my perspective is um, Nextcloud is something that is basically started as some kind of file server, then moved into file sync and share but nowadays it's a full collaboration software. So it's really about communicating and collaborating together and chatting and emailing and sharing calendars and sharing files and so on. So it's basically, a f yeah, it's a full collaboration suite. You can say that it is something like an alternative to Dropbox and to Google Suite and to Office 365 with the main differences that it's self-hosted, 100% open source and distributed and federated. So this is what we try to achieve. As I said at the beginning of the talk, I think it's really important to do this in a distributed and federated way so that we can all make sure that our data is stored in a safe way and we control the, the destiny of our digital future here. So thanks a lot. I don't know if there's still time for... <laughs> Thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have two questions. First of all, if I'm uh, using Gmail uh, for very long time, uh, what kind of user experience issues I will have? Let's say I get used to some Gmail features and lots of my uh, <coughs> uh, teammates and colleagues uh, get used to it. If yeah. I go to them and say, hey guys, there is next part, they will think, oh yeah, but it doesn't have this and that. Yeah. So is it really hard from a UX UI perspective? Yeah, Gmail is, uh, that you pick the, the toughest job. Yeah. <laughs> because that's, that's of course a bit difficult because first of all, um, with Gmail, you have some kind of login because it's the email address, right? It's like the domain and you can't transfer this to another server. So you will definitely lose, lose your email address if you want to move from Gmail to something else using Nextcloud. That's the first challenge. Yeah, but I have uh, my own domain. Oh, awesome. Very good. <laughs> Very good, yes. Okay, you can do that, exactly. Um, so then what you have to do is you have to um, have some kind of Linux server and all Linux distributions nowadays come with all the SMTP and IMAP mail servers that you need to fully replace Gmail and Nextcloud is then the, the front end for that. So Nextcloud, we don't have, a, we're, not, we're not really a full mail server, we are the front end on top of a mail server, which is not a problem because as I said, many Linux distributions that come with five different IMAP <laughs> servers and whatever. So that's all good, um, and you can do this. I'm, I wouldn't claim that in the email area we have all the features of Gmail. Um, so Gmail has all these extensions and things. We don't have everything here, unfortunately yet. But I mean, all the basic stuff is working, and we have encryption, for example, support encrypted emails, and 
and other things. But it's, um, I wouldn't say that we have all the features of Gmail yet. But we are hopefully getting there. Yeah. And the second question is follow up to this one. Is uh, uh, how, how uh, common is it for users of Nextcloud to host Net Nextcloud on uh, public cloud? <laughs> Um, with, if you mean with public cloud, something like AWS or Azure or something, um, that's a lot of people do it, but it's not super common. Most go to a service provider like like Linode or there's some others where you get like I don't know a little bit of resources for really little money, um, and they're hosted there, or they're hosted on some root server. Or it's if they get some space from their university or something, something like that. I don't think a lot of people actually deploy it on, on Amazon. You could, it's possible with one click, but um, yeah, it's not. If you do this, then you can use something else anyways. There's not a lot of benefit. Yeah, as you say, Nextcloud has end to end encryption. Yes. So, uh, it should be no problem to host it. That's true, that's true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, uh, for the presentation. Um, you had one um, slide uh, called uh, the, the Federation. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what I'm uh, wondering is, are all, so all these uh, home clouds are connected, but is there a user management uh, over this cloud? So let's mm. say a user from Nextcloud A, is that also available from another Nextcloud? Yeah, this is... Um this is uh, complex and a lot of different options. So if you install a Nextcloud and use another Nextcloud, then don't know each other, obviously. Right? You, there's no way, I mean, there you can share if you know the user ID of this other person. So as we use something called a federated sharing ID or the federation ID, which is username at hostname. So it looks similar to an email address. So it's the username and then an at sign, and then you have the URL of this other server. And if you type this in, then this one server sends a sharing request to the other server, and hey, uh, does this person want to share, and they can accept or not, and then the connection is established. But you have to know this ID, similar as you have to know an email address. So this is the trivial version. Of course, what we really want to have is a full auto-completion of users, like have you have with Facebook and Google and the others. And you can achieve this in different ways. Option number one is you use a shared shared directory. So if this all is run by the same organization or by organizations that trust each other, you can use the same LDAP or Active Directory. And then you can auto-complete people on different servers. First option. Second option is we have a concept called um, um, trusted servers. So if I, as the admin of my server, um, at your server as a trusted server and you do the same, then our servers know each other and they trust each other and they can exchange address books. Which then means um, I can auto-complete people on your server and you and your users can also find my users on my server with auto-completion. That's the second option. And third option is we have an, uh, an component, an optional component called a lookup server where that you can host somewhere else. And then people can decide to publish their identity on this lookup server and then be found by others. You can think about it as a GPG key server, where you can do GPG without a key server. You have to exchange your keys manually, or you decide to publish your public identity on this central server, and then other people can find you. And this is we sometimes use if you have a group of universities and they, they want to collaborate, and then people can say, yes, I want to be found, and by this username, and by this picture, and this email address, or whatever, click, it's published in lookup server, and others can find you with autocomplete then. Okay. Thank you, and uh, the second question, which was new to me, is actually the Thunderbird plugin. Um, so what is that able to do, um, yeah. besides uh, um, sending big files? Yeah, there are, actually, there are actually two plugins. First is like the sending of big files, as you mentioned, for the attachment. And the second is the integration of the calendar and contacts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a quick question. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. Okay. I'll give you this one, just for the sharing. 
Hey, uh, it's a bit of a silly question, but uh, uh, I assume the migration from Ishikawa data on, say, and as you're allowed, you want to migrate your data without experiencing much downtime. Um, is the migration totally manual? Is there like a seamless integration? Is that impossible? Migrating from where? From, say, uh, a cloud service to next cloud. So ah, okay. <coughs> like like Dropbox or OneDrive or something? If you're, if you're, if you're data, as in, our, in our case, lots of our data is on an Azure server. So okay. And uh, yeah. you know, there's a website that feeds the data from there. Sure. So when you migrate, you don't want much of a downtime. So. Yeah. Yeah, you have lots of different options. I mean, the good thing about this kind of services are there are many files, so my files you can just move over. Um, that's super easy. Um, challenges, of course, if you have shares with others. You don't want to lose these shares with other who are don't migrate, at least not at the same time. <coughs> That's a bit more tricky. Um, a lot of organizations who do this kind of migrations, they use this, um, this, um, this data access engine concept that I showed earlier, where you then can say, look, from now on, access to, let's say, Dropbox is blocked in your, our company, but you can actually mount your existing Dropbox into your next cloud as a subfolder. And then you basically you use Nextcloud and you have your files and over time you can drag and drop, move them over. But you still have your old Dropbox account in there and you also have your shares, your Dropbox shares in this folder in your Nextcloud. So this could be a migration step then. A lot of people do it like that. Sorry to interrupt, I think we got to pretty wrap it up there. So <laughs> sure. thank you very much for okay. the great presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks.